Okay, let's everyone come in, find a seat. If you have a seat next to you, you can lift your hand and someone can come sit next to you. Okay, it's my privilege this morning to inter- introduce to you by video, okay, Rick Renner. How many of you are familiar with, with Rick Renner's ministry? Uh, he's uh, an apostle in Russia. In fact, even right now, we're, uh, I believe his church there is having influence, and, and we speak confusion over the Russian camp in Jesus' name and protection over, over Zelensky and the, uh, the president and all the, and the people in the church in Ukraine in Jesus' name. But uh, Rick, Rick Renner is an, one of the premier teachers in the body of Christ today. Uh, man, he, you, you guys are going to love him. How many of you have not heard Rick Renner? Okay, you guys are in for a great treat. Uh, he, he's, man, he, he's like an apostle in, in Russia, uh, the birth of a great movement there. And uh, he's, man, he, he opens up the Word of God, uh, explains the Greek and the Hebrew like no Greeks or Hebrews ever have seen before. And uh, he, he's just, I'm telling you, you guys are really going to be blessed today. So, uh, man, get ready, buckle your seatbelts, and we are going to hear from Rick Renner. I don't know if he couldn't be here because of what's going on over there, you know, but the bottom line is we're going to get him via video. So let's give a warm Karis Bible College welcome to Rick Renner by video. All right. Hey friends, my name is Rick Renner and I want to say thank you for letting me be with you today and specifically I want to greet Andrew and Jamie. Thank you guys for letting me be with all your students and be right there in Karis. I want to say hello to Mike and Carrie and to my old time friends Daniel and Tracy Amstutz. We love all of you and we wish that we were there physically but we're not so this is the best we can do and I want to say thank you for the opportunity to speak into the lives of your students today. And hey guys, I want you to take good notes, so reach for a pen or reach for a pencil and a piece of paper and get ready to take notes and get ready to write in the margins of your Bible because today I'm going to be giving you a lot of things that I believe you're going to want to write down. But first I want to tell you that I have a gift for you. I've written a book which is called Life in the combat zone. The subtitle says, How to Survive, Thrive, and Overcome in the Midst of Difficult Situations. And a lot of what I'm going to be teaching you today is in this book, but I can't cover everything that's in the book, so I want to give it to you. But just one per household. So if two of you are from the same family and you're both attending school, just one book per family. But this is a gift of our ministry to you. But hey, reach for your Bible. You need to know that Rick Renner believes in the Bible, and I'm believing for a revival of the Bible in the church. But today, I want you to open your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 1, and we're going to begin in verse 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1, where Paul says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. Those words, according to, in Greek, are very important. It is the word kata, and the word kata in this verse carries the idea of something that is dominating or something that is subjugating, and he's declaring from the very outset, I am being dominated, I am being subjugated by the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. And this was very important because at that particular moment, life was being threatened for all believers. So Paul begins by saying we are dominated We are subjugated. We are conquered by a promise of life. Then in verse 2, he says to Timothy, My dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. But notice he says to Timothy, My dearly beloved son, then he gives his salutation, grace, mercy, and peace. And this is a diversion from most of Paul's salutations. Usually Paul says grace, and peace be unto you. By the way, do you know why he says that? Because one was a Greek greeting, the other was a Hebrew greeting. The word grace is the word charis, and that's the way the Greeks greeted each other. When they would walk up to each other, even among unbelievers, they would say charis, 
It was the equivalent of saying, hello, grace be to you. That's the way they greeted each other in the Greek world. But in the Jewish world, they said, shalom. That here is the word peace. And by saying grace and peace, not only was Paul saying grace and peace be unto you, but in one salutation, he was embracing all of his Greek listeners, all of his Hebrew listeners. With this one phrase, he was wrapping his arms around the entire world, Gentiles and Jews. But in this verse, he adds the word peace. I'm sorry, the word mercy. And that is very unusual for Paul because, again, Paul usually simply says grace and peace be unto you. But here he says, grace, mercy, and peace be unto you. And at the particular time that Paul was writing to Timothy, Timothy was really undergoing life-threatening situations. The church was under assault. I'll explain that assault to you in just a moment. But because Timothy and the church was under assault, they needed to hear about more than grace and more than peace. And Paul tucked mercy between the grace and the peace. And I believe this is so important because it tells me and you that when a person feels like they're really under stress or they're in a life-threatening situation, something difficult to deal with, God doesn't just give you grace and peace, but he tucks a little mercy in the middle of it. God always extends mercy to those that are troubled. And that's what you find in this verse. And then notice that he goes on and he says in verse 3, I thank my God, whom I serve for my forefathers with pure conscience, that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day. Without ceasing in Greek means without a pause, without an interval, which means Timothy and the church of Ephesus was on his mind all the time in so much. He says, I'm making mention of you in my prayers. And the word mention here is a form of the Greek word menea. And the word menea is the Greek word for a statue, a monument, or some kind of big statue that would remind you of what someone did or about an event. Well, think about it. What is the purpose of a statue or a monument? A statue reminds you of someone. A monument may remind you of a specific event. And every time you see that statue, you're reminded of what a person did. Every time you see the monument, you're reminded of what happened there. And Paul now uses this word menea, and it could literally be translated in my prayers, I'm building statues and monuments of you, which means Paul meant, I am stacking the throne room of heaven with statues and monuments of you in my prayers. Everywhere God looks, he sees you there. And then he looks over here and he sees you there and he sees you there and he sees you there. Why? Because I am building statues and monuments of you in heaven with my prayers so that God is continually confronted by you and what you are facing. That must have been such a comfort to the heart of Timothy to know that Paul was interceding for him so fervently and was stacking the throne room of heaven filled with his images. I remember when my grandmother, Renner, was getting very old. One day she said to me, ah, Rick, she said, I'm of no good. I can't do anything but sit in this chair and pray for you. I said, Grandma, that might be the best thing you ever did for me. Please keep calling my name out to God in prayer. And you know what's interesting? You find this same word, menea, here translated remembrance in Acts chapter 10, when the Bible says that Cornelius' prayers had come up as a memorial before God. It's the very same word, the word menea. And it tells us that when we pray effectively and when we pray in faith, we literally construct things in the sight of God that God sees that God is confronted with, and our prayers stand as ever-living monuments, reminders for God to not forget us or whoever we're praying for and to move in our behalf. And Paul said to Timothy, I'm loading the throne room of heaven filled with statues and monuments of you so God will be confronted with you and with what you're dealing with right now. And then he goes on and he says in verse 4, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears that I may be filled with joy. But notice he says, being mindful of thy tears. And the word tears here is plural. It wasn't one teardrop. Timothy was really crying. In fact, you could translate this, being mindful of your sobbing. 
And some scholars say that when Paul had received a letter from Timothy, he could see the teardrops of Timothy stained on the parchment. Why was Timothy praying? Why was he undergoing a life-threatening situation? Well, let me give you a little history. Now, hold on, because this is going to be quite a bit of history, but it's important for you to have this history to understand the background to 2 Timothy. When you come to 2 Timothy, the situation is very, very different from 1 Timothy. In 1 Timothy, the church in Ephesus that Timothy is leading is prospering, it's growing. In fact, the church in Ephesus was growing so fast, one scholar has estimated 50% of Ephesus had come to Christ. They were living in what we would call revival. But between 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, there's an interlude of three years. And in those three years, Nero went crazy and he began persecuting believers all over the Roman Empire, particularly in the big, big cities. And by the time that you come to 2 Timothy, the church is really under assault and people are dying for their faith. And fire always reveals the true commitment of people. It's very easy to be a fair weather friend or a fair weather Christian when it costs you nothing. But when suddenly your faith is going to cost you something or you're going to lose your friends or you might lose your job or you might lose your reputation, you might even lose your life, that kind of fire reveals how authentic people really are. And in 2 Timothy, Timothy has been devastated because people that he thought were really committed have abandoned him and they have walked out. They've walked out on the church. They've abandoned Timothy. He feels like he has been stabbed in the back. He's wounded by it all. And not only that, he's not so sure that he might be arrested. He might be arrested for his faith because he is the most visible leader in the city of Ephesus. And if they could arrest him and if they could kill him miserably, it would scare all the other Christians out of their faith and back to the pagan temples. And Timothy knows all of that is a prospect that is in front of him. And he's taken with a spirit of fear. We know that because of verse 7, where Paul says to him, God has not given you a spirit of fear. By the way, the word spirit really is the word for a spirit. Fear is a spirit. You can feel it when fear comes into the room. It is spiritual. It will throw you into a state of panic. And the word fear is the Greek word delay, which describes something that causes you to be a coward or something that causes you to want to retreat, to not face reality. And Paul goes on in 2 Timothy 1 verse 7. He says, God's not given you a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. But when you have a spirit of fear, you cannot operate in power. You really can't walk in love, the Greek word agape, because you're afraid of everybody. They've hurt you. You're wounded. You're afraid that you're going to be wounded again. So you really can't operate in love as you should. And rather than have a sound mind, you have an unsound mind, a mind that thinks irrationally, a mind that imagines things are going to happen that could never happen in a million years, but your mind has become unsound, it's become irrational because you're being controlled by a spirit of fear. And Timothy had a spirit of fear. And if anybody ever had a legitimate reason to have fear, it really was Timothy. But Timothy had written a letter to the Apostle Paul and he had poured his heart out, said, Paul, I'm hurt. People that I thought would always be faithful, they've abandoned me. They've walked out on me. Paul, I don't know if I can continue this. And now Paul writes back to him, and that is this letter that we call 2 Timothy. It is his response to Timothy. And he has seen on Timothy's letter to him teardrops. He knows that Timothy is crying. Nero has lost his mind. But let me give you a little history about the imperial family. It all began with Julius Caesar. And Julius Caesar was the first emperor of the Roman Empire. He had a fling with Cleopatra. He even had a son by Cleopatra whose name was Caesarea. He was killed in the Roman Senate as he was stabbed in the back brutally by 44 senators. And immediately after that, another man came to power whose name was Augustus, who was the nephew of Julius Caesar. And Augustus declared himself to be God and ruled the Roman Empire for 56 years. But after his death, his adopted son, 
whose name was Tiberius, became the ruler of the Roman Empire. And my friends, Tiberius was demented and he was perverted. In fact, Tiberius was so perverted that eventually he retreated to the island of Capri, just off the coast of Italy, which he turned into a sex orgy island. And orgies took place all the time there. He nearly never left there. And there on the island was his nephew, whose name was Caligula. And Caligula was subjected to all kinds of sexual perversion and sexual abuse. It was horrible. Well, Caligula went through. But finally, Tiberius died after ruling for 22 years. And guess who became the next ruler of the Roman Empire? Caligula. And Caligula was carrying in him all of that hurt, all of those wounds, all of those abuses. And now he sat on the throne as the most powerful person in the world. And even though for the first six months of his rule, he did pretty fine, he got real sick in the sixth month of his reign. And after that fever left him, he was deranged. He was insane. In fact, Caligula was so insane, he began to see himself like he was the Greek god Cronus. Cronus was a Greek god that was upset with his sister because she became pregnant. So when she gave birth to the babies, Cronus ate the babies. Now, I know that's just horrible, but Caligula was so demented, he saw himself as Cronus. So when his sister had babies, he ate her babies. Then he killed the sister. He had other, one other living sister, and this is very important to the story. Her name was Agrippina. He had an incestuous relationship with Agrippina. But Caligula was so foul he was so twisted that finally his soldiers could not take any more of it. And after ruling for 14 years, they murdered him. And when they murdered him, then Claudius became ruler of the Roman Empire. Claudius was the uncle of Caligula and was the great grandnephew of Augustus Caesar. He ruled the Roman Empire for 14 years. And guess what? He married a woman named Agrippina, who was the sister of Caligula. You're going to see Agrippina shows up again and again. She was the sister of Caligula. She was sexually abused by her brother Caligula, who was the Roman emperor. Then Claudius became the emperor, the same Agrippina, the sister of Caligula, who had been abused, married Claudius. And when she came into that marriage, she'd already been married once, so she had a son from a previous marriage. His name was Nero. Well, Claudius already had a son. His name was Britannicus. And according to law, Britannicus would become the next ruler of the Roman Empire. But Agrippina, who was a very conniving, powerful, and manipulative woman, a woman that had been abused, and abusers usually become abusers, she began to manipulate the situation and had her husband Claudius, the emperor of the Roman Empire, killed by feeding him a batch of poisonous mushrooms. When Claudius died, she immediately declared Nero to be the new ruler of the Roman Empire. Agrippina was Nero's mother. So now we see this woman moving through three different administrations. First, she was the sister of Caligula, who was the Roman emperor. Then she was the wife of Claudius, who was the next ruler of the Roman empire. Then Nero becomes the ruler of the Roman empire. She is his mother. It is amazing. And she was so conniving and so manipulative that she tried to manipulate Nero and through him rule the whole Roman Empire. Well, according to history, the first five years of Nero's rule, he was pretty normal. But after about five years, he went crazy. And just so you understand, he became the most powerful man in the world when he was 16 years old. Can you imagine giving all power in the world to a 16-year-old, telling him that he is God and there's nothing that he cannot have and cannot do? That's who Nero was. And Nero was so infatuated with himself and his own deity that he declared he was going to tear down the old city of Rome and build a new city in its place, and he was going to call it Neropolis after his name, Nero. And the very middle of Neropolis, he wanted to build himself a new palace, which he called the Golden Palace. 
Well, the Roman Senate would not let him do that. They wouldn't let him do that. They said, what are you talking about? The city of Rome is ancient. It's part of our history. You want to tear down the central section of Rome, which is, by the way, where all the senators lived, so you can build yourself a big new house? And they said no. So he went out to his palace just outside of town, and from there, he dispatched servants into the city of Rome with the instruction to start a fire. And they started a fire in the big circus where all the chariot races took place. And the embers of that fire began to blow across the city of Rome. And Rome, though it had great imperial buildings made of stone, had thousands and thousands of little shanties built of wood, hay, and stubble where all the slaves lived. All of those little shanties caught on fire. And before they knew it, the whole city of Rome was on fire, particularly the section where Nero wanted to build his big house. When the fire was finally extinguished, the area where Nero wanted to build his house was completely clean of all of those houses. It had all been reduced to rubbish and embers because of the fire. And immediately Nero began building his golden palace, which he finally constructed, that was so large, it was 300 acres. Now, if you think somebody has a big house, nobody has a big house compared to the house that Nero built 300 acres. And because Nero believed that he was God, he erected in the middle of it a statue that was 90 feet tall that looked like it was the god Helos, but instead of the face of Helos, it had the face of Nero, looking like Nero was the one that brought light and glory to the planet. And finally, the Senate said, hey, we, we, we know what happened. Nero burned down this city so he could build that house. And they called him in for his own trial and his own execution. And on his way to the Senate, he concocted a very diabolical idea. I will blame that new group in town called Christians for the fire. I'll shift the blame to them. Now, I just want to tell you the reason I gave you all the imperial history is because I want you to understand that if anybody could be nutty naturally, it would have been Nero. His predecessors were nutty. Caligula was nutty. His mother was crazy. In fact, his mother was so crazy that eventually he had his own mother murdered just to get her out of his life. So if anybody could be nutty naturally, it would have been Nero. But Nero clearly was also demonically influenced. And when he finally stood in front of the Senate, he said, how could you accuse me of burning down the city of Rome? I will tell you who burned down the city of Rome. And the senator said, tell us, give us proof. He said, that group in town, that new group called Christians, they've been standing on our street corners preaching. They are the ones who burned down the city of Rome. And by the way, all of that is in this book, which I'm going to be giving you. Number one, he said, Christians are anti-government. They're anti-government. They are talking about another king and another kingdom. Of course, they were talking about Jesus, that he made it look like they were subverters of government. That is what Christians were accused of. It's interesting that Christians are being accused of that again today. He said, number two, he said, Christians are lawbreakers. Christians are being accused of that again today. But the reason he said they were lawbreakers is because Christians were meeting illegally, and indeed they were. The scripture says to forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, but Christians were not given permission to meet. So every time they met, they were breaking the law and they had to choose. Are we going to obey the law of man? Or are we going to obey the law of God? And my friends, we're facing a time in our lives when we have to choose whose law we're going to obey. And they chose to obey the law of God, but it made them lawbreakers. So first he said they're governmental subverters. Secondly, they're lawbreakers. Thirdly, he said they're sexual deviants. <laughs> sexual deviants? He said, yes. They practice something called a love feast. Well, we know what a love feast is. That's where we meet together and have communion or perhaps we even have a meal together. But in his mind, he was saying Christians were sexual deviants and were having orgies. Well, 
to make sure you understand how graphic he must have been in this charge, Nero himself was quite sexually twisted. He was married to a man. He had killed his wife. He kicked her in the stomach when she was pregnant because he was angry. He felt such grief for killing her that he married a man who he ordered to dress like his dead wife to kind of deal with his guilt that he had killed her. So he's married to a man who's dressed like his wife. My friends, the mess we're seeing in the world today is nothing new. Transgenderism, people that are confused about their gender, it's always been. And there's evidence that Nero had even married another man at one point. We're talking about people really, really messed up. And now a sexual deviant is accusing Christians are being sexual perverts. What did he say? For a pervert to accuse others of being perverted, he had to say something really raunchy. But wait, there's more. He said Christians are cannibals. He really said that. He said, yes, the leader of their sect, Jesus of Nazareth, said, except you eat my blood and drink my flesh, you will have no part in me, and they have an event where they eat flesh and drink blood. Of course, he was referring to communion, but on the basis of this, he charged Christians with cannibalism, and dear friends, Christians had to fight allegations of cannibalism for 200 years after that because Nero had been so convincing. But wait, there's one more charge. He said, why would you think I burned down the city when these Christians have been standing on our street corners publicly preaching and declaring that one day in the future a big fire is coming? They told us a big fire was coming and we should have listened to them more carefully because they were giving us a clue that they were going to start a fire and burn down the city of Rome. And by the time that Nero was finished bringing these allegations against believers, the Senate believed him. They believed him. And immediately the first governmental persecution began. It was in the year 64. Now that's important for you to understand because Christians were not originally persecuted by the government. Originally it was a religious persecution of the Jews against the Christians. The first governmental persecution began in the year 64 after Nero delivered all of these allegations to the Roman Senate. And suddenly Christians became hunted like wild animals. They were burned at the stake. They were decapitated. They were rounded up. They were put into prison. They were fed to animals in amphitheaters. It was horrible, horrible what was going on. But all of this happened due to Nero looking for a scapegoat to blame the fire on. All of that is the background to the book of 2 Timothy. So now Timothy is leading the big church in Ephesus that has never known governmental persecution. It's had to do with religious persecution, but never state persecution. But now state persecution has erupted across the empire, particularly in the big cities. And the biggest cities in the Roman Empire were Rome, Alexandria, Antioch, and Ephesus. And these four cities especially were under assault. They were rounding up believers. So in this moment of fire, many people that Timothy thought would be faithful to the end said, see you later, pastor. It was fun serving Jesus when it didn't cost us anything. But hey, this is a different game now. This is going to cost us something. And people that he thought he could depend on bailed out on him and walked out. And there he is standing, leading the biggest church in the world. The church of Ephesus was the biggest in the world, which is now declining so rapidly they can hardly keep track of how many people are leaving the church because of a spirit of fear. And that is why Timothy has written this letter to Paul and has said, Paul, please help me. I am so hurt. I'm taken with the spirit of fear. I don't know how to deal with my church. I don't know how to choose new leaders because I've been so hurt by my former leaders. What's the chance that I won't be deceived and stabbed in the back again? He's pouring his heart out in this letter to Paul. And where is Paul? Paul is in prison in Rome. <laughs> Timothy is a free man. And he is writing to Paul 
who is in jail in Rome. Why is he in jail? Because the Roman government rounded up the principal Christian leaders to accuse them of being the chief arsonists of the fire that burned down the city of Rome. Now Paul is sitting in prison in Rome. He is not being persecuted as a Christian. He has been imprisoned on the charge of arson. Arson, which by the way is why most Christians in those days were burned at the stake. In the Roman Empire, you died according to your crime. If you were a thief and you stole with your hand, they cut your hand off. If you were an arson, then they burned you. And that's why many, many Christians were burned at the stake. And now Paul is in prison in Rome. And the big news in Rome is they found one of the chief arsonists that planned the fire that burned down the city of Rome. And because Paul is in prison, he can't even defend himself. The fake news is out there. It's being written on all the walls and all the public places. We found one of the chief arsonists. We've got him in jail. The whole city of Rome is talking about this arsonist, Paul, that is in prison. And now because Paul is a Roman citizen, he has the right to receive mail, and he's received this letter from Timothy. And Timothy is writing to Paul. Paul is absolutely facing death. And Timothy says, Paul, you just can't possibly understand what I feel. You just can't understand the spirit of fear that I'm dealing with, the hurt that I feel. He's writing to Paul, who's sitting in jail, facing death. It's amazing to me that we all think that our problem is worse than someone else's. My friends, your problem is never worse than somebody else's. You're really not in that bad a shape. You just have a spirit of fear. But now he writes to Paul, who really does have serious problems, and says, help me. And so now Paul writes back, 2 Timothy says, I saw your letter. I saw your tears. I know that you're sobbing and you're weeping. And then he says, Timothy, I need to remind you of a few things. Listen to this. Verse 5, this is a very unusual statement. He says, when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt in thy, first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded that it's in thee also. Then he says in verse 6, Wherefore, I put thee in remembrance that thou mightest stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. Now think about it. Timothy is crying out for help. Please help me. Please help me. Send me a letter. Communicate with me. Tell me how I'm going to deal with my situation. And how does Paul begin communicating to Timothy? He says, hmm, Timothy, I can remember the unfeigned faith that is in you that first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded that in thee also he begins reminding Timothy of his past. People usually deal with the spirit of fear when all they're doing is looking at the future and something is foreboding, something looks challenging, and they're forgetting what they've already been through in the past. My friends, never forget the works of the Lord in your life. It gives you a launching pad to deal with your future and to launch into your future. But when you forget God's faithfulness in the past, it causes you to tremble when you look at the future. But if all you're doing is looking at the future, my friends, you need to put everything on pause and turn around and rehearse all the things you've already walked through. You've had moments in your past that you didn't think you would ever survive. You didn't know if you'd be able to pay your bills, but you did. You didn't know where you would live, but you have a place to live. You didn't know how you would eat, but the fact is you've eaten and eaten and eaten until fact today you probably knew, need to lose weight. You've done all right. Even though you've walked through many, 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 many difficult things, you walked through all of them. Faith worked. God was faithful. And if you walk through all of those events into your present, it will so stir you up that you'll be able to look at your future with confidence. And that's why he's reminding Timothy of the past. He said, Timothy, when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in you, which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, 
It was the equivalent of saying, hey, Timothy, put everything on pause for a moment. Let me remind you of a few things. I knew your grandmother. Your grandmother had a real, living, unfeigned faith. She went through so many things and came through them, and God was never unfaithful to her. God was faithful to your grandmother. And by the way, I also knew your mother. And your mother had the same kind of unfeigned, unbreakable, real, authentic faith. Faith worked for your mother. God was always faithful to your mother. He's walking Timothy through his past heritage saying, God was faithful here. God was faithful here. God was faithful here. And I'm convinced this same unfeigned faith is in you also. Well, what does the word unfeigned mean? Well, believe it or not, the word unfeigned would be better translated a non-hypocritical faith. A non-hypocritical faith. To understand that, you have to understand where the word hypocrite comes from. The word hypocrite is the old Greek word for an actor who wore a mask. In the Greek and Roman world, when actors stood on the stage and played their parts, they wore masks. They played parts, they wore masks, and to help you understand, I brought a real mask from the Greek world. This is very, very old. This precedes the first century, so this little mask is more than 2,000 years old. This was worn by an actor on a stage. The actors wore masks. They pretended to be who they were not. They would say anything do anything for the applause of the crowd. And for that reason, actors were considered to be morally the very lowest people in society because they would say anything, they would do anything for the applause of the crowd. They were considered to be people with no integrity whatsoever because they just panned to the whims of the audience. And they wore masks pretending to be who they were not. So, The word hypocrite really describes somebody that is bogus, somebody that is a pretender, somebody that is a fake, or somebody just wearing a mask. Keep that in your mind when you read every time that Jesus speaks to the Pharisees and Sadducees, and he calls them hypocrites. That's where this comes from. The word hypocrite describes an actor wearing a mask. And when Jesus called the scribes and Pharisees hypocrites, it was the equivalent of saying, I know who you guys are. You're just actors. You don't mean one thing you're saying. You're just playing for those that are watching. You're just playing to the whims of the crowd, wanting their applause. You're nothing but actors. You're bogus. You're pretenders. You're just a bunch of charlatans. You don't mean the thing that you say. You're just donning a mask because people are watching. You are inauthentic. Well, now we come to this verse. He says, you don't have a hypocritical faith. You have an unfeigned faith, which means your faith is not hypocritical. On the contrary, it is authentic. It is the real deal. Your faith is the real deal. And the faith that you have is the same faith that dwelt in your grandmother Lois. By the way, that word dwelt is the Greek word describes living in a house, thriving in a house. It means his grandmother had such a strong faith, it lived in her. It thrived in her. Timothy saw that in his grandmother. He said the same living, thriving faith was in your mother. It was passed from her mother to her, and now it's been passed from your mother to you. And here we also find the great privilege of passing faith from generation to generation. And if you're the first in your generation to believe, that means you have the awesome honor of passing your faith to another generation. But Paul says, Timothy, 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 you're just having the spirit of fear because of a bad memory. Put it all on pause. Turn around. Look at your past. Remember God's faithfulness to your family. Your grandmother had a real authentic faith. Your mother had a real authentic faith. God was with them, walked through everything with them. And I'm convinced the same kind of faith is in you, Timothy. You have a real, unbendable, unbreakable faith. And then he says in verse 6, Wherefore I put you in remembrance, that thou mayest stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. But the Greek actually says it very differently. How does it say it? 
the Greek says, Wherefore, I'm reminding you of all of these things. Are you listening to me? I want you to get this. Wherefore, I'm reminding you of all of these things. What things? That your grandmother had a real unbendable, unbreakable faith. She gave it to her daughter, your mother, who also had an unbendable, unbreakable faith. God's record with your family has always been faithful, 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 faithful. And now I'm reminding you of all of these things. And the Greek says that by your remembering them, you will stir up the gift of God that is in you by the putting on of my hands. Paul says, by by remembering them, you'll stir up the gift of God. Hmm. Stir up is a Greek word which means to rekindle the embers, take a poker, stick it into the embers, begin to work those embers and stir those coals until finally the fire begins burning again. You can't do that unless you have a poker. Well, what is the poker that God has put in your hands? Memory. That's what he says here. That by your remembering, stirring the coals, going back to reactivate those memories again, that by your remembering them, you will stir up the gift of God that is in you by the putting on of my hands. Most people want somebody to lay hands on them in order for them to be stirred up, and that's good. If if that's possible, that's wonderful. But what are you going to do if there's no one nearby to lay hands on you? That's all right. You're still in good shape because you have memory. You can use your memory to stir yourself up. For example, in my own ministry, I have faced more difficult moments than I have time to tell you about. I just recently wrote our entire autobiography called Unlikely. Let me tell you, it is unlikely our story. It is unlikely we have survived. It is unlikely what we're doing. And I've had many moments in my life when I have felt like, God, I don't know if I can push through this one. Lord, this assault is so serious, I just don't know. And in those moments, here's what I do. I take Paul's words to mind. I put everything on pause. I say I'm going to quit dealing with what I'm facing with right now. I'm going to turn around to remember my past. And I mentally begin to walk through all the things we've already lived through that seemed impossible. Hmm. When it seemed that plane was going to crash, but it didn't. When it seemed we didn't have the money to do our ministry and oh, we didn't know how we were going to do it, but God came through. When it looked like the government was against us and there was no hope, but we got through it. I began walking myself through every impossible thing that I've already been through. And by the time that I walked through all of those events up into my current moment, I am so filled with faith that I believe everything is possible. If God could do that, and God could do that, and God could do that, and God could do that, if God's record with me has been faithfulness, 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 then who in the world am I to think this new situation is too big for him or too big for me? Greater is he that's in me than he that is in the world. By remembering, I stir up the gift of God that is in me. That's what Paul says. He says, hey, Timothy, you want to know why I'm talking to you about your family? It's because I want you to remember a few things. I want you to remember your past. I put you in remembrance of all these things that by your remembering them, remembering them and remembering them, you'll stir up the gift of God that is in you. Your memory is your poker that you can stick into your fire to stir yourself up. And I guarantee you, friend, If you remember everything you've already been through and how God has been faithful, you will look at your new problem and say, this is nothing. (laughs) If I can get through all of that, I can absolutely get through this. And Paul says, wherefore, I put you in remembrance that by your remembering all of these things, thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. Then in verse 7 he says, for God hath not given us the spirit of fear. Again, the word spirit, is the Greek word which really describes a spirit. You can feel it when it comes in the room. 
immediately the atmosphere changes, the feeling in the room changes. It is a spiritual thing that takes place and it begins to produce in you fear, again from the Greek word delea, which describes a coward or one who retreats to protect himself. Rather than move forward to deal with life, you try to hide from life. Timothy was trying to hide from his problems rather than deal with them. My friends, that, that just doesn't work. You've got to deal with what's in front of you. And a spirit of fear will cause you to move into our retreat mode. And then he adds, God's not given you a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. The word power is the word dunamis. Now, I know that you've heard that word dunamis, but let me give you some insights to the word dunamis that you may not have heard. The word dunamis is the very Greek word that described a force of nature, like a hurricane. It described a tornado. It would be the word to describe an earthquake. The word dunamis is also the Greek word that was very often used to describe the full might of the advancing Roman army. Rather than retreat in a spirit of fear, when the Spirit of God is operating inside of you, you become a supernatural force of nature. You become like a divine hurricane, a divine tornado to wipe things out that need to be removed. You become like an earthquake to shake things up. When God's power is working in you, you are divinely enabled to march forward and take new territory. All of that's in this word, power. But then he says also God has given you love. The word love is the Greek word agape, high-level love. The word agape describes love with no strings attached. It's love that can never be wounded. It can never be disappointed because it has no expectations. My friends, if you've been disappointed by somebody else, probably you were not moving in agape love because when you move in agape love, you're going to love regardless of how people respond or do not respond. Timothy's been hurt by people who abandoned him. He needs to move into high-level love because you can't get hurt when you move in high-level love. And lastly, God's given you a sound mind. I love this in Greek. It's the word sophronismos, from the word sozo, which means to be saved or to be delivered or to be preserved. And the word phren, which is the Greek word for one's intelligence or brains. When you put the two words together, I say the easiest translation of sophronismos, which here is translated a sound mind, is saved brains, where God has given you a delivered head. But when you have a spirit of fear, you're irrational. You're irrational. You're illogical because you're taken with a spirit of fear, but God didn't give you a spirit of fear. He gave you a mind that is sophronismos. It is set free. It is delivered. It's healed. It is not to be affected by exterior things. You can lay claim to all of that. And then Paul says in verse 8, and this is where we're going to wrap it up for right now. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. But notice he says, be not thou therefore ashamed. In Greek, it is a prohibition. Stop being ashamed. Well, that tells us to what extent a spirit of fear had gripped him. He was ashamed. He was ashamed to be a Christian. People were saying bad things about Christians. He was tempted to be ashamed. And the word ashamed here means to be red-faced. He was blushing with embarrassment because he was a Christian and people were saying such bad things about Christians. And Paul says, stop being ashamed of me and of the Lord. Timothy was even afraid to be associated with Paul. Hey, Paul was a hot topic. He was sitting in prison in Rome. Timothy doesn't even know if he should keep his relationship with Paul because it could cost him his life to be in relationship with Paul. And Paul says, hey, Timothy, just cut it out. Just cut it out right now. Put an end to this spirit of fear. Stop being ashamed of the Lord or of me, his prisoner. And then he says, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. Now, I know that we're not all wanting to embrace afflictions. But here, Paul said, hey, if you have to deal with hardship, deal with hardship. He said, be thou partaker. 
partaker of what? Of the afflictions of the gospel. And sometimes afflictions come with the gospel. We have to remember that we are light bearers and Satan hates the light and he hates those who carry the light. He tries to insult us. He tries to spread rumors about us that are not true. He tries to take us down. My friends, it just comes with the territory. I'm not telling you to run out by faith and accept all these assaults. That assaults come. But the good news is, this verse says you can be partaker of the affliction of the gospel. What? According to the power of God. According to in Greek is this word kata, which describes something that dominates, subjugates, or conquers. It means in the middle of all of that hardship, you personally in the midst of all of it can be kata, dominated, subjugated. You can be conquered by the power of God, which means, and this is really the truth. I'm a witness to this. Many people are witnesses to this. History is filled as a testimony to this that when believers suffer for their faith or take a stand and refuse to budge, the power of God shows up. You suffer according to the power of God. So you're not just dealing with it by yourself, but suddenly God's power shows up in the middle of that situation. You are dominated. You are conquered. You're subjugated by the divine power of God, which enables you to be strong even though you may feel like you're in the middle of the fire. That's it for today, but I hope you enjoyed this. Be sure to get your book, Life in the Combat Zone, and I look forward to our next session. Good morning and welcome back. This is session two with Rick Renner. I want to welcome those back who are joining us online. And if you are just joining us uh, now, the first session, Rick Renner was talking about how to survive, how to thrive, and how to overcome in difficult situations. And man, what a timely message this is, huh? Extremely powerful. He ended on how to overcome the spirit of fear. So once again, if you're just joining us now, I recommend uh, rechecking that out. And then for all of us here, this is recorded. So if this is something that you're wanting to go back and listen to, you can definitely do so. Um, at this time, we'd like to take an offering for Rick and his ministry. So if I can have the ushers come up and pass out the envelopes. Uh, once again, a little bit of housekeeping here. You know, please fill out the envelopes fully. This, this gives us the ability to give you a receipt. Um, if you're going to write a check, please make your check out to Karis Bible College, and we're going to make sure that every cent gets to Rick and his ministry. And if you'd like to give online, <clears throat> you can do so go, by going to renner.org, R-E-N-N-E-R.org, and that's his website. You know, Rick, Rick has been such a blessing and praise God for the free book that he just gave everybody. You know, he, he sows into us. And I was praying about what to do because he, he, is, he is applying what he's preaching. You know, he's being a light to Russia and to the people in Russia, uh, you know, obviously during this conflict and things along those lines. But when I was praying about this message and what to do for this specific offering, I was reminded of 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Who here has heard, uh, if, you sow, uh, scare, like if you sow scarcely, you'll reap scarcely, but if you sow bountifully, you'll reap bountifully? Who's, who's, who's uh, heard that before? Can I see a raise of hands? The context of that verse is back in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, where it's talking about give according to what you have. You know, I was, I was reminded as I was thinking of that as the woman with the two mites, Jesus said, surely I say to you that she's given more than out of everybody who's given out of their abundance. So if you're wanting to sow into Rick's work and, and what they're doing all over Russia and what they're doing just for eternity there, and you're like, well, I don't have much to give. I beg to differ, you do. Like whatever you do have, you know, as you purpose in your heart, give out, give out like the Lord loves a cheerful giver. Give according to what you've purposed in your heart and out of the abundance of what you do have, God considers that different and it is impactful and you're going to reap bountifully. 
And the, the lives, also the context of Corinthians, talking about giving to those who are in need. You know, Rick, he's full of wisdom, as you can tell. And what he's doing in the ministry is genuinely to help serve the needs of others. And the fruit, will, it's, it's, gonna, it's not returning void, but it's going to multiply and it's going to increase. And what you guys are purposing in your heart to give in this offering is going to have an eternal impact and an eternal reward. And God is going to bless and multiply back unto you much more than what you're giving now. And be in earnest expectation to receive so that you can give unto every good work. So I bless you guys. Thank you so much for giving into Rick and for his ministry. Uh, can we please pass out the buckets? I'd like to just pray over the offering. Father, first off, thank you for this word that's going out. This is absolutely phenomenal. We thank you for sending Rick, and we thank you for the opportunity we get to listen to this timely word. And I thank you for every contribution here. Once again, we put this offering in your hands, and we thank you for blessing it and for multiplying it. We thank you for multiplying it in the work that, that you're doing in Russia and all and each individual that this is going to impact through Rick's ministry. And I also thank you for the sowers, that you give seed to the sowers and bread to the eaters. I thank you for increase for each person that's partaking and sowing according to your unction, according to the joy that, that you're giving them in this offering. I thank you for blessing this and multiplying it in Jesus' name. Amen. All righty, so I'm, I'm going to cue it. So we're going to go session two. Once again, this is Rick Renner. Um, this might end a little bit early, so you guys can enjoy a little bit longer of a break. But, you know, co come into this session eager and expecting to receive once again, because this is going to be another powerful, powerful session. God bless you. Hey, friends, this is Rick Renner. Thank you for letting me be with you today. And I especially want to say thank you to Andrew and Jamie, my friends, for nearly 40 years. Can you believe it? Andrew and Jamie, we've been doing this a long time. I also want to greet Mike and Carrie and my dear, dear friends, Daniel and Tracy and everybody else that's there. And thank you so much for the honor of speaking to all the students at Karis. Hey guys, did you enjoy the last session? I would love to hear from you and to know what you got new out of it or tell your dean what you thought about the teaching. I would really love some feedback because I'm really giving you my best. I know that in the last session, I gave you a lot of history, but you know, history really helps you understand the context of every book in the New Testament. And that's why I'm giving you my book called Life in the Combat Zone, which has the full teaching of what I'm trying to pack into two sessions. I can't get everything into the two sessions, so I want you to have the whole book in our ministry is going to give it to you. One per family. So if two of you are from the same household, but you're attending the school, just one book per family, please do that. But I want every household to walk away with this book called Life in the Combat Zone. The subtitle says, How to Survive, Thrive, and Overcome in the Midst of Difficult Situations. But reach for your Bible. And today I want you to return to 2 Timothy chapter 1. And we saw in our last session that the church in Ephesus, the church in Rome, the church in Alexandria, the church in Antioch, particularly those four large cities, was really under assault the first government-issued persecution. Now, I realize that most Christians think that the church was always persecuted by the government, but it was not. There was no empire-wide official legal persecution of the government against the church until the year 64. All persecution previous to that time was a religious persecution. Pagans who didn't like the new faith, Jews who didn't like these new Christians, it was a religious persecution and it was very, very intense. But in the year 64, when the great fire of Rome took place and Rome was burned to the ground, Nero alleged that Christians were behind the burning. He accused them of being arsonists. And for that reason, the government issued the order to begin to round up these Christians in the biggest cities of the Roman Empire, and they were being put in prison. They were being hunted like animals. It was horrific what began to happen to the early church nearly overnight. Now, just imagine... If you in your country have never had to deal with 
governmental persecution. But in one night, everything changed and Christians began to be rounded up, put in prison, burned at the stake, decapitated, thrown to animals. Some Christians might say, hey, 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 hey. When we entered the game, we didn't know this was the game we were going to play. No, uh, well, we're not up for this. We never agreed to this. Fire always reveals who people really are. We don't want fire. None of us want it. But it comes whether we want it or not. And fire always reveals who people are. And when the fire came to Ephesus, many people that Timothy thought were solid leaders, he had worked with them for years and years, some of them trained by the Apostle Paul, but they'd never been through this kind of fire. And the fire was so intense that a great number of them began to bail out and abandon ship. And now Timothy is leading the church of Ephesus and he is devastated because of people that he thought he could trust, that he could always depend upon. And they came to him and said, see you later, pastor. We're not up for this. We never agreed to this. And they began jumping ship. And now he is leading a great church that is in decline because of persecution. Funerals to conduct, people that are dying, people that are being fed to the lions in the local stadium. Horrible, horrible things. And when he needs his leaders to be there to help him, where are they? A great number of them left. And he is just devastated. And we know from 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, that he has a spirit of fear. Why does he have a spirit of fear? Because he's the most visible Christian in the city. He could be rounded up. Imagine, if Roman authorities could get their hands on him, he's the most visible leader in the city. Imagine what kind of a wretched death they would give to him in order to scare all the surviving believers. And Timothy knew, if they ever get their hands on me, there's no telling what they're going to do to me. And he knew they could knock on his door at any moment. And rather than remember God's faithful delivering power through everything he's already been through in the past, he's focusing on what he's facing right now. And I told you in the last session, if all you do is face what you're looking at right now. It's going to scare you. It's going to open the door for a spirit of fear. And that's why you need to put it on pause and walk through the history of God's faithfulness with you in the past. But finally, we come to 2 Timothy 1, verse 8. We covered this in the last session. Let's cover it again. Paul says, Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of the Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. When he says, be not thou therefore ashamed, the word ashamed is a Greek word which describes one that is so embarrassed their face is blushed, their face is red. They're red-faced. And here in the Greek it is a negative with a prohibition which means stop being ashamed. What in the world are you ashamed of? Stop being ashamed, number one, of the testimony of our Lord, secondly, nor of me, his prisoner. Why was Timothy tempted to be ashamed of Paul? Because Paul's a prisoner. He's in prison in Rome. He's been rounded up. He's been called one of the chief arsonists that burned down the fire of Rome. The fake news is out there. And anyone affiliated with Paul becomes a target. And now Paul says to Timothy, Timothy, put an end to this spirit of fear. Stop being ashamed of the Lord or of me, his prisoner, And then he adds, be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. Now, I know that when you've lived in a free country, and your country has been very free until recent years, where Christians haven't had to deal with a lot of flack, now we've entered a new season. And sometimes when you stand for your faith and you stand for biblical values, you have to put up with flack, people that come against you. It just goes with the gospel. It may be new to you. It's not new to the rest of the world. The rest of the world's been encountering this for a long, long time. There are afflictions sometimes that come with the gospel. But Paul says to Timothy, and he says to me and to you, suffer according to the power of God. And according to is the Greek word kata. And the word kata describes something that is dominating, 
subjugating, conquering. And here we have a divine promise that if you're dealing with hardship because of the gospel, the power of God will show up on you. The power of God will dominate you. The power of God will subjugate you. The power of God will conquer you, which means you're not going to deal with a hardship by yourself, but in the midst of it, God will join himself to you and the power of God will enable you and strengthen you to deal with that. You will experience the power of God and stories of God's power showing up in the early days when the church was being persecuted are amazing. For example, Nero, when he burned Christians in his own backyard, dipped them in tar, tied them to stakes, set them on fire, he waited to hear them scream in terror that Nero was terrorized by them because he heard them singing songs antiphonally to God while their bodies burned. They may have been burning, but they were in the power of God, dominated. They experienced the divine power of God. Now, I'm not hoping or wishing or prophesying that you're going to be burned at the stake. But my friends, for whatever it is you're dealing with, if those believers could experience the power of God, the power of God is available to you as well. And that's what he says. Be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel, being dominated, subjugated, conquered by the power of God. Then he says in verse nine, who has saved us, called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, verse 10, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death. That was important because they were all facing death. He's abolished death and brought life and immortality to light. Then he adds, through the gospel. Hang on to that. Through the gospel. And then in verse 11, he says, where unto? What does that mean? Unto this gospel. Where unto this great glorious gospel, he says, I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. He's magnifying his office. He says it's unto this great, glorious, powerful, delivering gospel that I've been appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. And then in verse 12, he says, for the which cause. I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed for... I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. And I'm going to use my notes because I have some wonderful things to share with you today. But notice he says, I'm appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles for the which cause I also suffer these things. Paul was able to keep it all clear in his head. And you need to keep it clear too. When he came under attack, People begin to say vicious, untrue things about him. Here he is in jail being accused of being an arsonist. Number one, he knew the truth. He was not an arsonist and he had committed no crime. You need to know the truth about yourself and be confident and be free in your own conscience. Paul was free in himself. He knew who he was. He says, hey, I have committed no crime. Under this great and glorious gospel, I've been appointed a preacher an apostle, a teacher of the Gentile, for the which cause? It's because of the call on my life. It is because of the gospel that this attack has been triggered. Paul was able to keep it clear. It wasn't personal about him. It was about the call. It was about the message. The devil was after the message, and he was after that man who carried the message. We carry light. And Satan hates the light, and he hates the light bearers. And Paul understood it's not about me. It's about my call. It's about the message. Unto this gospel, I've been appointed a preacher, an apostle, a teacher of the Gentiles, and that's why I'm suffering these things. And the word suffer here is the Greek word pasco, and the word pasco is a very important Greek word which primarily carries the idea of emotional suffering. It's very strong in relation to feelings. Emotional suffering. What kind of emotional suffering 
was Paul dealing with? Well, he was in prison. He knew the whole world was talking about him. The whole world at that time really was the whole world of the Roman Empire. The whole Roman Empire heard the name of this notorious criminal that had been arrested, who was one of the ringleaders who forged the arson to burn down the city of Rome. And Paul is in jail, and emotionally he knows there's a lot of bad press out there about me that is not true. And not only that, when you come to 2 Timothy chapter 4, he says that when he came to his first trial when he was arrested, all of his friends abandoned him. They walked out on him. They left him standing in the lurch at the worst possible moment, and now he is in jail. And Paul says, you know, I've been through some emotional trauma in the middle of all these events. But he says, nevertheless, I'm not ashamed. And the word ashamed is this Greek word which means to be disgraced. He says, I'm not disgraced. It means to be put to shame, to be embarrassed. The very Greek word, which means to be red-faced or your face to be completely blushed from embarrassment. Paul says, I'm not red-faced. I'm not ashamed. And he says, for I know whom I have believed. The words I know are a translation of the Greek word oida, which describes knowledge gained by personal experience or personal observation, it was the equivalent of saying, hey, I've had a lot of experience with God. And based on my experience with him and the things I've observed about his work in my life in the past, there are some things that I know. And I know whom I have believed. And I am persuaded, persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Circle that word persuaded in your Bible. It is a form of the Greek word patho. This is really, really important. The word patho describes one that is convinced, even better, one that has been coaxed into believing, one that has been swayed from one opinion to another opinion, as a result, now he has absolute confidence. He's convinced to the core. He has a rock-solid certainty, but because it is the word patho, it means he didn't begin with that rock-solid certainty. He had to talk himself into it. That's what the word patho means. Well, here was Paul sitting in jail. Let me ask you, who was going to encourage Paul? He was there by himself. This word patho here, translated persuaded, describes self-talk or self-persuasion. Sitting in that prison where Paul had suffered emotionally and was traumatized by all of these events and all the bad press about him, Paul knew it was time for him to stop listening to his thoughts. And it was time for him to start speaking to himself. There's a time when you have to tell your mind to be silent and you've got to speak to your mind and tell it what to think and tell it what to believe. And Paul began walking himself out of all of that anxiety into a place of faith. He swayed himself from one position to another. He coaxed himself from feeling any kind of fear into a place of faith until finally he was convinced to the core. He had a rock-solid certainty that God was going to see him through this. Self-talk. If you're in a place where you have no one to encourage you, I already saw you, number one, you have the power of memory. That's your stoker, your poker. You can stir your memories and stir up your faith, but you've got a mouth. And rather than to listen to all your doubtful speculations, you need to start using your mouth to talk yourself out of a bad place into a good place. And if you'll let your ears hear your mouth speaking words of faith, you'll begin to believe. The Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing. If you don't have anybody else to speak faith to you, let your mouth speak faith to you. Paul talked himself into a place of faith. Wow. And he says, I'm persuaded that he is able. The word able, the Greek word dunitas, it describes ability, capability, one that is competent for any task, a force that causes one to be capable, one that is competent. He says, God is absolutely capable of working in my situation, even though naturally he may have wondered if things were going to be okay. He talked himself, patho, into this place of faith. 
For I know whom I have believed and am persuaded. Rock solid certainty, patho. I've talked myself into this place of confidence and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed in him against that day. The word keep, a Greek word which means, listen, to save, to protect, to preserve, or to guard. So you could translate, he's able to save, protect, preserve, and guard, but this word keep is specifically a Greek word which depicted a military guard who showed uninterrupted vigilance in guarding a territory that had been assigned to him. It was the same word used to describe the uninterrupted vigilance of shepherds in keeping the flocks that they were responsible for. And by using this word keep, the Apostle Paul says, hey, I'm his territory. I belong to him. I called him the Lord of my life. I was assigned to him and now he is going to keep me like the great military guard that he is. God is going to use uninterrupted vigilance to watch over me and to keep me. I'm a sheep. He is my shepherd. And just like a shepherd who shows uninterrupted vigilance in keeping his flock, he is watching over me. You see, Paul's talked himself into quite a position of faith. He says he's able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. The word committed, the Greek word parathiki. Oh, it's such a wonderful word. The word para means alongside, like coming alongside of something. The word thiki means to place or to put. When you put the two words together, here in the King James Version, it's translated as the word committed, but it means to entrust, to deposit, to commit into one's charge or trust for safekeeping. And every time I see this Greek word parathiki, I go back in my mind to when I was a kid. My dad was paid on Thursday nights. And on Thursday nights, we did two things always. We went to buy groceries, and then daddy went by the bank. And back in those days, there were no drive through tellers, so you had to get out of your car, walk up to the bank where there was a depository box. Remember those days? If you don't remember those days, I'm telling you, one time people did this. It was a metal handle. It was something that you opened. It was the depository or the repository. And once you put your money in and closed it, it was irretrievable. Nobody could take it out. You couldn't take it out. You couldn't take it out. Once you put it in and closed the door, you were deposited into the bank. It was not even available for you to reach in and take out. And now Paul says, hey, I committed me unto him against that day. Para, I pulled up alongside of Christ. Thiki, I placed my life into him. I'm in him. Nobody can touch me. I can't even take myself out of him. I am in him. I'm locked up in him. There's no safer place than that. Wow. Paul's walked himself into this place of faith. Rock solid certainty. You can do that too. It doesn't matter where you are with your friends near you or nobody near you. You've got a mouth and you can patho, you can persuade yourself, coax yourself into a place of faith. That's what Paul did when he was imprisoned by himself. But hey, what triggers an attack? Well, turn in your Bibles over to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7 to our verse that is religiously misconstrued all the time. Andrew, I know you heard this one growing up because you and I grew up in the same denominational tradition. In 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7, Paul says, Unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. And of course, in my tradition that I grew up in, my denominational church, and Andrew, you too, I was told that Paul had a problem with arrogance and pride. And so God released the devil to keep him humble. But hey, the devil's never going to keep anybody humble. The devil's the author of pride. If the devil was released on him, 
the devil would have just made it worse. And I was also taught that the thorn in the flesh was some kind of a malady like epilepsy. We were told in my particular church that Paul had runny eyes. I read in one document that he was a hunchback and that he had club feet. Well, you can't find any of that in the Bible. That is just religious tradition, the sayings of men. Then what was the thorn in the flesh? Well, let's look at this verse. I want you to see what triggers an attack. First of all, he says, unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations. Exalted above measure, people take to mean pride. It doesn't mean that at all. It does not mean that. It's a Greek word, hooper, rio, which is a compound of the word hooper and the word rio. The word hooper means over, above, and beyond. It depicts something that is way beyond measure and conveys the idea of something that is greater, superior, higher, better, more than a match for utmost, paramount, or foremost. It describes something that is first rate, first class, top notch, unsurpassed, unequaled, unrivaled by any person or thing. That's the word hooper, the first part of the phrase exalted above measure. The second part of the word is the Greek word hiero, which means to lift up, to raise up, to be exalted. And when compounded, the two words together form the word hooparayo, which pictures a person who has been supremely exalted, one who has been magnified, increased, and lifted up to a place of great influence. And here Paul is describing the impact of his ministry. His ministry has gone to places nobody else has ever gone to. He has preached to kings, to governors. He has had an impact like no one else. And here Paul is acknowledging the impact of his ministry. He says through the abundance of the revelations. The word abundance, the Greek word hooper, balo, it's amazing. It's a compound of the word hooper and the word balo. The word hooper means to cast or the word balo means to cast or to throw when compounded together with the word hooper, it forms the word hooper balo, which describes something, listen to this, that is phenomenal, something that is extraordinary, unparalleled or unmatched. It is the very word which was used to describe an archer who aimed his arrow for the bullseye, but when he released the string, he shot his arrow and watched as the arrow flew way over the top of the target. It was the equivalent of saying, I have received revelations superior beyond What anybody else has ever heard or seen, he's describing the quality of his revelations. He says, and last, my impact should become too great because of these overshooting, magnificent revelations that I have received. There was given to me a thorn in the flesh. Well, because it says there was given to me, people religiously assume that it was given to him by God. Doesn't say that. He clearly says, It was the messenger of Satan. And in fact, when it says there was given me, a better translation would be there was assigned to me, assigned to me, a thorn in the flesh. Well, if the thorn was not an eye problem or epilepsy or club feet or a hunchback, what was the thorn? Well, the word thorn in Greek describes a dangerously sharp spiked instrument or tool that was used to describe the stake on which an enemy's head was stuck after being decapitated. Paul was saying, hey, my ministry has become so enhanced, so enlarged, so magnified. These revelations are so phenomenal that there was assigned to me a thorn in the flesh. The devil wants my head on a stake. And then he says, the messenger of Satan. The word messenger, the Greek word angelos, It's the word for an angel or one that is dispatched on a special mission. It could be a messenger who is dispatched to perform a specific assignment. And then he calls it specifically the messenger of Satan. The word Satan, the Greek word satanas, which describes one who conspires against. Because the word Satan is used here, it means Satan was developing conspiracies to take Paul down. There was no happenstance about this. He was working plans, working strategies to put Paul's head on a stake. And then he adds the messenger of Satan to 
Buffet me, the word buffet, the Greek word kolophidzo, but the original form of the word kolophidzo describes the knuckles, the knuckles. But when it becomes kolophidzo, like it's used in this verse, it refers to beatings with the fist and the tense describes unending, unrelenting, continuous, repetitious beatings and beatings and beatings and beatings. He said the messenger of Satan was dispatched and assigned to me, forming all kinds of conspiracies to regularly beat me and distract me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Now, when you put it all together, how should this verse be translated? Well, let me give you the RIV. You say, what's the RIV? Renner's interpretive version, which I'm really working on right now. It's a conceptual translation of the Greek New Testament. And here is the RIV of 2 Corinthians chapter 12, get seven, because this will blow religion out of the water. Here's a real translation of this verse. Are you ready? Because of the phenomenal revelations I have received, and on account of the vast number of these revelations that God has entrusted to me, and to hinder the highly visible progress I am making. A special messenger has been sent from Satan to harass me with constant distractions and headaches. There's no doubt about it. Satan wants my head on a stake. Satan is constantly trying to buffet and distract me in an attempt to keep me from reaching a higher level of visibility and recognition and to sidetrack me from preaching my revelations. Now that's a total different take on that verse, but that's really what the Greek means. I'm going to read it to you again. Because of the phenomenal revelations I've received and on account of the vast number of these revelations that God has entrusted to me and to hinder the highly visible progress that I am making, that's what it means, lest I should be exalted above measure. A special messenger has been sent from Satan to harass me with constant distractions and headaches. There's no doubt about it. Satan wants my head on a stake. That's what the word thorn means. <sighs> Satan is constantly trying to buffet and distract me in an attempt to keep me from reaching a higher level of visibility and recognition and to sidetrack me from preaching my revelations. <sighs> now that is amazing when you consider the King James Version says, 2 Corinthians 12, 7, lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of revelations there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure, lest I should be exalted above measure literally means to keep me from reaching a higher level of visibility and recognition and to sidetrack me from preaching my revelations. So Paul here in this verse says, you want to know why attacks happen? I'm going to tell you when you're on the edge of a great breakthrough, when you are really making progress, the devil's not going to sit on the side and just twiddle his thumbs and watch you go to amazing places. He, like Satan, the word Satan, is, is going to begin to develop conspiracies to slow you down, knock you out of the game. And when you become exceedingly threatening to the domain of darkness, he'll do everything he can to put your head on a stake. Now, why is this so important? And why was Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 1 so clear about understanding he was suffering because of his call? Because he was writing to Timothy and Timothy was suffering. He's saying to Timothy, 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 don't, don't personalize this. It's not about you. He said, unto this gospel, I'm appointed a preacher, an apostle, a teacher of the Gentiles. For the which cause? It's because of that, because of the call on me, because of the gospel that's been entrusted to me, because of the revelations that I preach. For the which cause? I also suffer these things. Wow. But I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed. He knew who he was. He knew who he was not. Do you? You need to know who you are. When you enter into the ministry and into public life, there's a lot of talk about you that people have never met you and don't know a thing about you, but they hear something, what somebody else said, and they begin to repeat it as if it is fact, and they don't have a clue what they're talking about. That's why it's important for you to know who you are. You need to know who you are. And Paul says, I'm not ashamed. 
He's had some time to think because he is in prison. He says, for I know, the Greek word oida, I've had experience with God. I've had a lot of observations of how God works in my life. And I am persuaded, the Greek word patho, rather than give way to a spirit of fear, I've swayed myself, I've coaxed myself into a rock solid position, rock solid certainty of believing that he is able to keep He is the uninterrupted vigilance of a guard that's watching over me because I am his property. I'm a sheep and therefore he has the uninterrupted vigilance of a shepherd and he is watching over me and he is going to keep what I have committed unto him, parathiki. Para, I pulled up alongside of him, para. I'm alongside of him, thiki. I entrusted, I committed, I deposited myself into him, can't even retrieve myself out of him. I am in him. I'm safe in him. Wow. But then when you come to 2 Timothy 1 verse 14, he continues to say to Timothy, that good thing which was committed unto you, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. And now we find that just as we pulled up alongside of Christ and placed ourselves in Him, Christ has deposited some things in us. He also has made a deposit. That's what it says in verse 14. That good thing, what God has placed in you, your dream, your vision, the Holy Ghost in you, He calls it a good thing. It's a good thing. It's so good the devil's after it. That good thing which was committed unto thee, committed unto thee is the same word committed which we saw in the previous verse. Parathiki. God came alongside of us and placed in us. He made a deposit into us. And the verse says we are to keep it by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. And guess what? The word keep is the same word keep which is used (laughs) amazingly in verse 12, where Paul says, he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him. Now the same word is used here, which means keep, the Greek word tereo, the uninterrupted vigilance of a soldier who walks over a particular piece of property that's been assigned to his guard, or the uninterrupted vigilance of a shepherd who's been appointed to watch over a sheep or a flock of sheep. Now Paul says in the same way that God is watching over you because you're his property. In the same way that Christ is watching over you like a shepherd because you are his sheep. You in the very same way are to have uninterrupted vigilance in guarding what God has entrusted to you. That is your assignment. That is your property. You hang on to it. You hold on to it and you don't let anybody take it from you. Like a shepherd watching over a sheep, you watch over that precious thing, that good thing which was placed in you by the Holy Ghost which dwells in us. Oh, it's so powerful. The Holy Ghost dwells in us which means we're not doing this by ourselves. We're doing this with the help of the Holy Ghost. But hey, I want to quote to you 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. Because you might say, oh, this is a big assignment. I'm under such pressure. And when you're under pressure, you're tempted to let go and to release. Don't let go. Don't release. You can win the battle. You can because 1 John 5, verse 4 says, For whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. It begins by saying whatever is born of God. Are you born of God? Then it's describing you. It's describing me. I am born of God. If you've called Jesus the Lord of your life, you are born of God. Well, then what does this verse say to you? Whatever is born of God overcometh, overcometh the world. The word world, the Greek word cosmos, it describes world, society, Everything around you is really a good word for us to meditate on right now. We overcome society. We overcome all of our surroundings. For this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. But you know what's really interesting when you read this in the Greek text? The word overcometh, the word victory, and the word overcometh again 
All three times in Greek is the word niki. It says niki, 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 three times in a single verse. And this is very, very unusual, unless you're really trying to make a point. And this word translated overcometh victory and overcometh again. The Greek word niki means to conquer, to overcome. It is the word which was used to portray athletes who gained the mastery in a competition and reign supreme as champions, ultimate champions, or the superior position of an overcomer. And according to this verse, whatever is born of God, overcomes Niki, the world. And this is the Niki, the victory that overcometh Niki, the world. Even our faith is like God is throwing victory in our direction. But the only way to retain that victory, it says, is through faith. And that leads us back to 2 Timothy 1 verse 12 where Paul says, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded. The Greek word patho. Oh, I love that. One that is convinced, coaxed or swayed from one opinion to the opinion of another. One that has developed absolute confidence, convinced to the core, rock solid certainty rather than give way to his emotions and give way to what he's hearing people say about him rather than give way to speculations about what possibly could happen which would create in him a spirit of fear. Paul's decided to quit listening to what his head is saying and start speaking to himself. And he walks himself, patho, into rock solid certainty, a place of faith. And even though he was in prison, being lamb blasted by the world all around him for something that he did not do, he stayed in faith and stayed in victory. And now he's got this letter from Timothy who is free, who's worried that he might suffer. He's not suffering yet, but he's worried that he might suffer. But Timothy has written a letter to Paul who really is in jail. And the prisoner is having more victory than Timothy because he's not controlled by a spirit of fear. Timothy is. And even in jail, he's in better shape than Timothy who is free because Paul has chosen to stay in a place of faith and not give way to a spirit of fear. And my friend, if you've had to deal with a spirit of fear, I rebuke it in the name of Jesus. It's a spirit. You have to take authority over it. Just like it came, it will leave you. I rebuke that spirit of fear in the name of Jesus and I charge you to begin using your mouth to speak words of faith, to walk yourself into a position where you are rock solid, convinced to the core that He is able to keep whatever it is that you've committed unto Him. Thank you for letting me be with you. And Andrew and Jamie, what a privilege to speak to your students. I love you, and I pray that this has been a blessing to you today.